Hi, I'm Praveena. Thanks for the lovely introduction. I work for Neo4j um, as a software developer at the moment. Um, so if you want to know something about Neo4j, just talk to me or about microservices, talk to me. Um, so this talk was born out of a necessity because um, I was working with microservices for a while and you hear a lot about um, microservices like kind of like a snake oil kind of thing. So I wanted to um, talk a bit more about having worked with microservices, what are some of the confessions that I have. Um, I do like microservices. It's, it's a very, very good uh, strat strategy to tackle um, problems that we face at the moment, especially if you're working on a legacy code base and you're, ha you're facing scaling problems and you're facing um, issues with continuous deployment and not being able to ship code quickly. Uh, but may uh, I'm, I would like to talk more about some uh, practical lessons learned and uh, how we fixed some of the problems that we had in terms of communication and other things that come as part and parcel of like dealing with microservices. Um, so microservices are great. Let me put it out there. Uh, I spoke about it in, uh, I have done so in, in few conferences and that was the last one that I spoke at. And if you don't trust me, if you think that you're just some random lady I met like five minutes back, uh, then do have a look at all the conferences out there. There's usually a separate track on microservices uh, alone. For the last, at least for the last three years, I've been seeing this. So if you don't trust me, you can pick up any of these conferences and go like go through the tracks there. Um, if you don't trust the people there, you also can look at some of the famous companies that are out there which have microservices uh, and they are able to like successfully move forward, launch their products and make difference uh, to, the, to the end users who use those services. Um, one thing to note, however, is um, all of these companies have been around only since maybe 2000s. Um, so I used to work in, uh, in a company which was where we had to move from a legacy code base, which was around 40 years old and parts of it were there and no one knew what it was doing. So uh, we were, we, I, was, I used to work as a consultant. So we were brought into like, like any time we have to uh, develop and deploy something, uh, we do the entire development cycle and it takes three months to deploy this to production. So we really need help and we think you're the right kind of people, set of people to come and help us do this. And we came in like our capes on and everything and said so like, boom, microservices is going to solve this. Uh, <laughs> it wasn't that easy. So I'll, I'll go through what all we had to do to, you know, to bridge those gaps. Um, I've covered this. Okay, you, uh, in my experience, you make software by, uh, better by continuous experimentation and innovation. Um, your ecosystem changes so often that you you have to re really like you can't even catch a breath. And if your uh, infrastructure is dated, there's no way you can um, harness and um, use the new technologies that are available out there. Um, so I think engineering teams should strive to have an environment which, which helps you to both experiment and innovate in, in your space. Um, as a developer, uh, I think I can speak for myself. As a developer, I want to make the end user experience better because uh, it doesn't matter if I'm building this like Sistine Chapel, if no one's going to come visit it or it's going to, you know, what do you call it? It's, in, it, it's inaccessible for most part of my uh, users. It's, it's of no use at all. Um, so I want to make the end user experience better. Um, I want quick turnaround uh, to fix bugs and fix features. If they are not useful, just remove them or like add features wherever it is necessary. And I also want uh, to bolster confidence in the product for the people who pay for that application or people who have vested interest in uh, making this product better. And in my opinion, software development is all about changes uh, and how you're able to quickly make those possible for to make your end user experience better. Um, and so we decided to use microservices, but of course with great power comes great responsibilities, um, which kind of made me um, grumpy cat in a team of like 40 developers. 
because microservices, uh, the benefits of microservices I have written in a handy note. Uh, <laughs> um, the benefits of microservices is definitely having like strong module boundaries. So if you were to change something, you know, um, sufficiently like these are the places that I would have to touch. And it also having microservices helps you to deploy only those bits of uh, places where you have changed instead of waiting for a three month cycle to deploy the entire application in production. And you can choose to have tech, uh, diversity in the technology that you use. Um, so these are the very, very good aspects of microservices. And of course, uh, the costs to have these good aspects came in terms of distribution and having uh, like the cost, the actual cost dollars associated with having running all of these instances and like launching these things. Um, and having those tough conversations around how your system would be eventually consistent because let's be honest not every uh, domain out there is going to be conducive to that and in order for you to identify which parts of your application can uh, do away with eventual consistency and introducing those changes accordingly was a huge part of the upfront analysis that we had to do and apart from all of these things there's a huge cost in operational uh, complexity which is what happens when I touch this, which are the other services that I have to deploy. First of all, if it is microservices and it's supposed to be autonomous, why do I have to deploy all these other services? Um, so many times we had to uh, learn things by making those hard mistakes. Um, yeah, so you need to you need to do the tough job to, to be able to um, access the power of microservices. Uh, teething problems, we had lots of teething problems that came about dealing with microservices. Um, one of the, I think almost all the times, anytime we had a big problem come up, uh, all we, it eventually came down to having a common dialect between different people in the team. When I say different people in the team, it's your end users, it's your analysts, developers, product owners. Uh, deployment specialists, your DevOps folks, all of these people. And I think for us, our biggest um, problem was actually tackling this common dialect, what it would mean. Because for my product owner, like they really didn't care as to whether which stage my microservice was stuck at or what was it, what was the problems causing it to not be deployed. All they cared about was whether they can test it out before releasing it to the end users um, and all our problems that we faced was solved with having this common dialect and having a common set of vocabulary between all our stakeholders. Um, one of the most uh, co uh, often asked questions, one of the often uh, asked questions was are we there yet? So we were finished with our development and the product owner would sign off the story and the next question was like when would it be deployed uh, because he spent a huge amount of money on this infrastructure i want to know when it is going to be deployed i thought it was going to be deployed tomorrow how is it going to happen uh, so that was our that was the biggest question that we would get quite a lot from our uh, end use uh, from our stakeholder this is an actual wall from the team that i was on um, and you can see that we have all of these different lanes. There are multiple different reasons why we had these many lanes. Depending on your team, you would have a variation of this. Some people just have ready, doing and done. Uh, we had to have these many lanes because there were like very valid reasons, uh, which I don't want to go into right now. But uh, one of the things I want you to notice is that we have the business review ready for prod here and we have the test environment and ready for test. So every time we would move uh, a card from like analysis, it would go through all of these things in a smooth fashion. And when something is in dev, we will have uh, extra stickies and notifications around this. Um, and when something is ready for uh, prod, we would also have like a green sticky attached to it. Let's go a little bit deeper into what that means. So for us, anytime we had a story that was ready to be deployed in an environment it was all about having a set of assembly instructions for what that feature meant um, in and and we will have a recipe for assembly so we have initially 
it's like any recipe that you see uh, whether it's a cake or microservices so we would have contents for the feature and we would have a set of instructions in our case the so this feature i'm talking about as an example is make user agent optional um, and in terms of contents for this feature to be deployed in any environment whether it's your test or your prod or whatever uh, we marked down the three services that had this change for this feature and the version numbers for those three services and the instruction is plain and simple just deploy using CI so it was a one button uh, deploy um, so all anytime you want to enable this feature in any environment whether it's your test staging or prod all you have to do is deploy these three versions and you will have that feature there so anytime anyone had to know anyone anytime anyone had all the uh, okay anytime if uh, to check whether this feature was available or not they just have to go to the configurations of the deployed versions of all the microservices in that environment and if they say and if they say, see these three numbers the product owner knows that it's already there so it was kind of a seamless environment for us to go from analysis down to um, down to uh, deployment why do i say analysis when, in terms of when we started off the analysis stage we would have um, obviously the ba would do the initial set of analysis which is about why do we need this feature who are the user personas who access this feature and we will also have technical input from our developers which who would say that okay to implement these features we think these are the three services before even we start development we, we suspect these are the three services that needs to be deployed and we would have a deployment strategy that goes with it sometimes um, in the case of say for example this card you would have a red color sticky on it which would mean that this feature can't be deployed until this other thing is deployed um, in order for this feature to work you need to turn this feature on or like turn this flag on kind of thing so we had those things even before we had those things analyzed even before we could start on the development this is very very different from what waterfall development is just so we are clear because it's not about like gathering all the requirements all of those things it's just analyzing it's just in time analysis where you get just enough information to start with the development no one is going to blame you if you had missed anything once you start doing the development but it's having a better idea of what your system would look like even before you start on the card so having some uh, clear consideration to how your the sanity of your environments and like not having baking changes and things like that it helped us a lot to have these contents and these instructions on every story that we were working on one of the definitions for user story is a user story is a placeholder for conversation and we used our user stories as exactly that so anything that you needed uh, regarding the user story gets added to the jira ticket or mingle whichever uh, system or trailer whichever one that you use and we would record all of this information like if you had to change the version number because in test it was um, identified as something else we would go change that version number there immediately so your we create we, we treated the user story as like a historical uh, thing then like all the information that needs to be added to the user story gets added there and that helped us establish a common dialect because all the information that was required for that feature for that specific functionality was on the user story and all of the, all of us stakeholders who were involved in it were able to use that um, and of course the things that they got uh, from the user story were very different for each and every persona um, the second thing that we had to deal with was the fear of uh, breaking things this was such a big thing because it kind of um, initially it made our relationship with our product owner very very strained because we would say that something is like it's going to be all right we're going to deploy this and everything is going to be fine but it won't be fine because we would have messed up with the order in which we deploy or something like that so it it took a few iterations to come around to that but our product owners were happy to some extent to have an open dialogue about it and having other sets of agile software development you know the things that like having uh, periodic retros after every iteration having your iteration really small those things help us address these problems and catch these problems as early as possible 
and uh, come up with different uh, um, like a structure to address those specific ones especially um, our product owner was worried because it's it was making uh, them lose face to the board members and i think it's very very hard sometimes for developers to understand where some of those frustrations come from and what we all we had to do was to bring in the product owner as part of the team instead of this person that we answer to and give that person all the information that they need to make those informed decisions so that they don't need to consult us before letting the board, uh, board members know that we are testing out something things might break so don't be alarmed i've got this under control kind of thing and um, so another thing that we did was um, microservices often talks about like you get to deploy it in production and something breaks just revert it to the other endpoint where it was working before but in practice it doesn't work like that um it might work for netflix for the scale that they operate in but if you're starting at like a very very ground level it takes a while for you to reach there um and so yeah so for us it was um testing in different environments helped us move uh, and identify some of those problems early on before it reached into production um so what we did was we took the um services and the version number and before it could reach in production we would do a trial run first in the test test environment and where all developers from all other teams were running their dev versions their um their like bleeding edge versions on it and if on our deployment we would run contract tests and things like that and if any of those tests fail we would know we, we will get that alarm earlier than actually doing that in staging and then in production so we would if if that were to happen our we treated the test environment the staging environment and the production environment with exactly the same concern that we treated the production environment as so if the same set of alarms were there and of course the panic is much higher if if this were to happen in production environment but it helped us uh, have these like different rituals and exercises if we find a breaking change happening we we continuously tested our rollback strategy and like what are the different things we could do if this thing breaks and or like if the endpoints which doesn't happen and not having those um snowflake environments having your uh like your cookie cutter environment helped us just i'm sorry i just need to probably clarify a snowflake environment is when you kind of like a snowflake is unique in design so if you can't reproduce your environment exactly the same way again then your environment is a snowflake environment but we didn't go we didn't do that we went ahead with what we call a cookie cutter environment they use the same recipes um same uh, what is the uh, thing for ansible equal and for chef recipes in ansible <laughs> oh god like this is so bad sorry yes that um so we we had we had the exact same cookbooks and recipes and things like that for all our test environments the exact same thing that would run on prod would run on our test environments um of course the environment num- like the instances would be like a toned down version of those environments if you're not uh, we'll use like a micro instance kind of thing if you're using an aws uh, infrastructure but we we managed to test our infrastructure and our pipelines by using the exact same things that we would do on a production environment and our services were deployed with the same pipeline and and that gave us enough confidence if something were to break we would be able to catch it early um uh, and this kind of helped us move and have that common dialect again where um if the product owner wanted to find out what stage this is in uh they could either look at the project wall and if they were to like deploy something on their own play environment that they had then all they have to do was use the same pipeline and deploy those versions themselves and because all of them was like a, a button click deployment it was very very easy for them to do those things uh and it kind of helped us to have the establish a common dialect between not only the people in the team but also between the microservices what i mean by that is we we started having cascading health checks that is if uh, my web app de- de- uh, depended on like service a and service b the health check of web app would test the health check of service a and service b 
and your he your health check of web app would fail if any of my dependent services uh, were not healthy um so that kind of helped us when we, like we had lot of like 404s or like uh, service unavailable exceptions and things like that it removed all of those things we um, uh, we used hystrix to have um circuit breakers which is um because this was a legacy environment we were dependent on services which weren't always reliable so we had to do some checks in terms of authentication and the authentication service was one of the most loaded service that was there and that was out of our control so our product owner was ready to take the decision wherein uh, he said that okay if you can't authenticate just show them the content anyways um so we had that of uh, that as a circuit breaker because all they wanted was they didn't want to lose the user um and like they wanted to replace the authentication service at a at another point in time um so it helped us having those conversations and include that as part of our architecture design in itself and uh, we had uh, mapped mdcs in our logging files we had um we would add um, correlation ids to our requests so it's like a tracer kind of mechanism and uh, we use the same uh, logging patterns and the logging uh, co configuration files so among all our services so in our kibana dashboards all we had to do was add those special identifiers for the request id and it would just light up the entire uh, what do you call it request request between like one service to another service to another service and because we were using hystrix circuit breakers it had its own metrics and we were able to identify if there were like fallbacks because of you know the authentication service failing and things like that and we were able to identify bottlenecks at a at a much faster rate than we ever thought we could um which also meant that we started having a lot of monitoring dashboards uh, per environment level and then per service level and these were generated automatically because after few services after doing I always feel like as a developer this should be a rule like rule of 3 it's good enough for Jesus it's good enough for all of us if you do something 3 times extract it you know into a common pattern and that was the case for us like when we when we start using the same things over and over again we would add it to a template and we would use the same template for other services um and it and it sort of helped us to experiment things as well in terms of microservices because if i if something wasn't working i can go and experiment it in isolation in one service and then the minute it works and we find it useful in some other service we would extract it out again um which which helped us to um use that thing of like having a heterogeneous architecture and we had a uniform sense of alerting as well we had all of these um sns topics that we the services would push messages into if it can't talk to its dependent service or like if one of its dependent services is down and uh, another thing that i talked about was uh, having service templates any time we we see that there is a need for something and we have repeated it three times we would put it into the service template and it will be available for all of us and even simple uh, things like having three letter abbreviations for each of your service like you need three letter abbreviations for each of your service like if you haven't done that please go ahead and do it and your life will be changed like if you get anything from this if you're not going to do anything from from this talk i'll say like adopt just two things one is have correlation ids and the other one is have like your service abbreviations it's very very simple to do please go ahead and do it um and of course we had contract tests after deployment so health check was the was the final one and it had to be really really quick but every time we would do the deployment we would run the integration tests of the other service as a contract test um the third and final thing that uh, we we concentrated a lot on and we had to learn very very quickly um as we went by there are a lot of startups which do this um like honeycomb.io is one of those things they have like monitoring and app metrics and things like that it's it's it seems like a really interesting product but um if you were to start off something small at least um there are a lot of metrics and logs that come from your jetty requests and like um i mean like just your server server like drop wizard has its own metrics it's very very simple to enable these things and just see what it produces before even you could 
go ahead and put it in Kibana, index it and all of these things. Just have a look at your logs and see what you could, what would be useful for it and try and monitor that. In terms of metrics, um, we started off with just having the ability to like log into your machine and look at the logs. Then we felt the need for having like an Elk stack, Elasticsearch, uh, Logstash and Kibana. And the three things uh, that we divided in that was having your business metrics, application metrics and your system metrics. Business metrics are usually the metrics that uh, my product owner was really caring about, which is number of user visits and how many downloads from the product they were doing. So we had this dashboard which would just show uh, this what do you call it like a like a chart of the user visits mapped against the downloads uh, events that we were sending and that was something that he was really caring about and the next thing was application metrics which was around like fallbacks and um, uh, exceptions and things like that from our services and of course the final thing was the system metrics which was around cpu and all of those things um, identifying these three different class of metrics and obviously the severity of these three things was different for different people uh, and having your dashboard cater to that was very very important the last thing you want to do is like have a dashboard that looks like your uh, what's the place where the pilot is in cockpit yeah that one yeah so the last thing you want is like a lot of buttons and a lot of controls out there you want to have a very very sleek uh, dashboard where it's not overloading of information and if there is an alert you want to know that there is an alert that's how your that's how your dashboard should look so try and like prune your dashboard as much as possible to have only the relevant information there um, so we used a bunch of uh, infrastructure around this so we use kibana grafana graphite Ben, and Riemann, and if you have used any of these you know like it would serve different things for different uh, in, like different kind of developers to look at and we use kibana extensively to show business metrics to our uh, product manager as well which which when i talk about it people often find it uh, difficult to believe but it was actually useful for us this was the bigger dashboard for us which had like um, so in this case you see cloudwatch alarms and like whether if any of our regions were down this was later simplified into just having like one tile which would go red um, when any of the regions were down instead of having all of this information and uh, these were the history fallbacks and we were if you see here we have I don't know whether you can see clearly but you can see that there are like three letter um, abbreviations for each of the services that were that was deployed in that environment and by turning on and off we were able to like just look at those specific logs um, this was the product dashboard that the um, product owner was using so this was the number of user visits and here if you see it just went down immediately and so this was from our um, test environment so in our test environment to simulate um, user visits we would run user journey tests continuously to uh, have that regular what do you call it regular the, the, just for the simulation and it kind of helped us to understand how the dashboard uh, should look and what was the difference between if it when it was happening in production environment and when the events were down here it probably meant that one of our dependent services were down and the users weren't even able to visit uh, which is definitely not a good thing for us and which means that something is broken in our deployment or something like that and we had to go fix that and both these dashboards were uh, rotated in our monitor and we would treat them exactly I mean not exactly but we would treat them in in the in the same fashion if if you see the number of visits going down in a QA environment it isn't something to take lightly as well um, so I just want to put this out there when you have met someone working with uh, microservices you meet one person who has worked with microservices so there's lots of information around there about what works what doesn't work what you should do and what you shouldn't and often it's portrayed in a very dogmatic way so i would say pick up those pieces which you think is relevant for you try it out in a small three years just to get acquainted and a new version of release it is out uh, microservices prerequisites is uh, is on uh, martin fowler's blog and i think microservices is not a free lunch illustrates some of the points that we have talked about right now 
there are a lot of microservices patterns out there and anti patterns and pitfalls are something that you need to be aware of to be able to identify when something isn't working out right the reason why it might not work in your uh, system and i would say um, there are a lot of people who ca you can follow on twitter if you aren't already following some of these please go ahead and do so and they talk quite frequently about microservices I think susan fowler um, if you already don't know her like she's yeah it's quite unfortunate she is famous for like the uber scandal but she has she has a very very good book on microservices i would say definitely go ahead and read that um charity majors is the ceo of um honeycomb i think not sure chris richardson um he talks a lot about microservices he has written a book as well and that's it thank you